Sing thee, Lord Jesus, 582. nothing in life that the believer should not be trusting Christ for. Faith is the center of the Christian life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so as we study the Word of God and as we learn more about God and about what he has done, it increases our faith in many different areas of life. Trusting thee forever and for all. We've read just a few moments ago the portion of text out of Exodus chapter 3 that deals with the names of God. A condensed portion of text including eight different names in that passage and yet we've discovered that there are many other names of God given to us in scripture. Last week we looked at part 12 and looked at the name of God whereby he declares that he is El Elyon, the Most High God. We saw that the very first occurrence, in fact, in the Old Testament and in all of Scripture uh, contains four uses of that same name. Not merely scattered over many different passages, there are 11 different places where it's found in the Scripture, but four of them occur in Genesis chapter 14, where we find... Abram the Hebrew, also the first place that we find him being called a Hebrew. Abram the Hebrew is coming back and returning after having rescued Lot and all the people of Sodom from the kings in the north who have carried them away captive. And as he is coming back south to get back toward the Dead Sea, he must pass by what we know today as the city of Jerusalem. And out of that city, which at that time was called Salem, which means peace, Jerusalem simply means the city of double peace, Ha'ir Shalom. It's a place which God had chosen to put his name. The king of Salem comes out to meet Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings. And he blesses Abraham, and Abraham pays him a tithe of all that he possesses. And then as he gets farther back toward the Dead Sea, the king of Sodom comes out to meet him. And the king of Sodom says, give me the persons and keep the goods for yourself. 
Satan always wants the people. He doesn't care about the goods. He can control that as he wishes. But he wants the souls of men and women and boys and girls. And Abram says, I'm not going to take even a shoelace from you because I have lifted up my hand to El Elyon, to God Most High, the Most High God. He is called the one who is the possessor of heaven and earth. Twice he is called that in this passage, and four times he is referred to as El Elyon. We saw that that was quoted in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 7, speaking of who this Melchizedek is. And that name itself, Melech Tzedek, Melech is king, Tzedek is righteousness. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of Salem, which Hebrews tells us means that he is the king of peace. He's without father, without mother, without beginning of days, without end of life, made like unto the Son of God. And that word made like unto is a word which means in his appearance, the visible appearance that Abraham could see. Of course, Melchizedek is a theophany because the book of Hebrews goes on to say very clearly that the less is blessed by the better. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Not merely a type of Christ, but the one who blesses is greater than the one who is blessed. And Abraham was the man to whom God had given the covenants. Abraham was going to be the one who through his loins would someday come the Messiah. Exciting as we look at the scriptures and compare them one with another. This Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of kings and blessed him. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. We saw Nebuchadnezzar calls him the Most High God. That's the name by which the heathen round about know the God of heaven. We saw Belshazzar and he is being addressed by the term Belshazzar king. You knew that the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, a kingdom. We saw that throughout the book of Daniel, this is the way in which the pagans view God. He is higher than their gods. The Most High God is the name by which the demonic forces know God. In two places, in Mark chapter 5, 7 and Acts 16, 17, demon-possessed people cry out and say, What do we have to do with you, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? Acts 16, the demon-possessed woman, possessed with a spirit of divination, it's translated, but that word divination is the word python. That's a Greek word. It means this great, powerful serpent. She cries out and says, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. The demons know who Jesus is. The demons know who the Most High God is. It is the name of the Most High God that is blasphemed when God's people disobey him, focus on money and material things, and commit immorality. And we saw many different passages of scripture that pointed those things out to us. Then we looked at the name El Olam, the everlasting God. Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. We saw that El Olam describes the nature of the Messiah. It's the phrase that is used in Micah chapter 5 verse 2. But thou Bethlehem, Ephrata, the be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. And then here's the phrase, whose goings forth have been from old from everlasting, from Olam. That is a descriptor of God himself, the one who is from everlasting. And when the scribes quote that passage to Herod, they leave the last phrase out. They say he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem of Judea because the prophet said so. And they quote the verse all the way up to the last phrase, whose goings forth have been from old, Kedem, even unto everlasting, forever. He is eternally existent. That's a descriptor of Christ, the one who is God come in the flesh. We saw it also over in Isaiah 9, 6, another famous passage of the Messiah. We saw his existence from eternity past to eternity future. It's essential to his nature. 
We saw that he is the wisdom of God, and God's wisdom is everlasting, Proverbs 8.23. Today that brings us to part 13. The name Jehovah is compounded with seven other words in the Old Testament. The one that we begin with today is Jehovah Jireh, Yireh, Yahweh Yireh. Literally that, we've already studied what Jehovah means, but Yireh, or Jireh, as it's written in English, J-I-R-E-H, literally means Jehovah will see. It's a future tense of the verb, we call it future, it's not precisely future in Hebrew, the way they structure their language, but for us it is a future tense. Jehovah will see. But it has an implication when it uses this particular word for Jehovah. God not only sees, but he sees with a goal of meeting a need. And so we find that same word being translated back in verse 8 as God will provide. When God sees the need, God meets the need of his people. This is a statement of the omniscience of God, but is more than a statement of merely his omniscience. Here is an infinite knowledge coupled with an infinite beneficial interest. We find it occurring in Genesis chapter 22, where God commands Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. Beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Hineni, behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Do you understand the pathos? The shock that must have run through Abraham's system. He has heard God speak before. He is not deceived as to who this is, speaking to him from heaven. He knows that this is the God who has told him that Ishmael will have some blessing, but it's not the blessing that God has for this son of Sarah. In Isaac will your seed be called. The promises are through Isaac. The book of Hebrews tells us something about Abraham. It says Abraham knew that this was the promise that God had made. And Abraham believed God that even if he killed his son Isaac, God would have to raise him from the dead because God had promised, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Dear people, I don't have that kind of faith. Can you imagine taking your dear child and God telling you, I'm sending you to a mountain where you are going to sacrifice that child. He doesn't tell you to do it now, and on the impulse, you just grit your teeth and do it. You walk. You walk. You walk. You walk. And you're thinking about it all the way, and here's this dear child walking next to you, chattering away as children will do, wondering at the wonderful God that is out there who made all these things, 
and your heart is like lead. But you believe God. Dear friends, do you believe God? That's our context. Offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And they walked for three days. On the third day, Abram lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abram said unto his young men, he had servants carrying along with him, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. Now listen to his faith in verse 5. And come again to you. He knew what God had told him to do. But here is the proof in the Old Testament of what the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews 11, affirms about the faith of Abraham. He knew that if he offered his son, God would have to raise him from the dead because God had promised in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And they went, both of them, together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, This is Isaac speaking, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for burnt offering? Now verse 8 takes that same word that we saw a few moments ago, gyra, and it is here in the form yere, but it's the same word, it means to see, but it's translated provide in verse 8 because the translators understood that this word was not merely seeing for the purpose of observing. It was seeing with the purpose of of meeting a need. And so they translated it this way, and Abraham said, My son, God will provide. Literally, it's God will see himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. That has a lot of impact. God not only sees, but he provides. But what did he see at that point? He not only looked down and saw Abraham and Isaac, but God saw himself a lamb for a burnt offering. He saw Jesus, the Lamb of God, on a different mountain 2,000 years later as the offering, as the sacrifice for sin. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. We come to the place, Abraham ties Isaac, he binds him. This is a young teenager by this time. Certainly could have outrun a man over a hundred years old. But he did not. He trusted his father, even as our Lord Jesus Christ trusted his heavenly father. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and if you've been with us any time, you know that the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ. He's not a created being. He is the messenger of Jehovah. That's what that term angel of the Lord means. He is the messenger of the covenant. He is the one who has made covenant, who cut covenant with Abraham, walking between the pieces of the sacrifice. And God swearing to Abraham that he would give him the land and a seed. 
And the Lord calls to him out of heaven and says to him, Avraham, Avraham, Abraham, Abraham. And he says, just like he said back in the earlier verses, Hineni, behold, here I am. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Now Abraham had another son, whose name was Ishmael. But when God looked down, he saw only one son. He saw only the son of promise. There are other promises for Ishmael. In fact, we see this name for God is used when Hagar speaks of God. But the covenant promises belonged to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. Now I know, did not God have Omniscience to know the future? Yes, of course he did. He knew what Abraham would do. He knew that he did not have to worry and bite his fingernails as to whether or not Abraham would obey. God certainly had that kind of knowledge. But we're talking about here of a different kind of seeing and providing and knowing and developing an intimate relationship with the one who is love. That's the picture that is given to us. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, and here is that name, Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the Mount of the Lord it shall be seen. That's a translation, that last part there, of Jehovah Jireh. Now we think of this name, and many times you will see commentators speak of it as the Lord will provide, and indeed that is true in the context of verse 8. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Same word, God will see himself for a burnt offering. But it's a seeing with the intent of providing for one who is loved. And God provided a physical sacrifice in place of Isaac because someday God would provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. As our Lord Jesus Christ hung on Calvary, he was looking down on the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount is Mount Moriah. What an incredible picture of God providing at the greatest cost to himself. In the Mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Someday you will stand on this mountain and looking up to another mountain see a sacrifice. This mountain where you are about to offer your son is going to provide the location where I dwell and from which will be seen the sacrifice that I will make. God is telling to Abraham. When God sees our need, he always Provides. He's not merely an omniscient observer, but he watches constantly for our protection, for our provision, for our discipline, for other beneficial actions. His name means Jehovah will see, but he is the one who sees and provides. Another example of this is with Hagar and Ishmael. Rather interesting, sort of a, a small reflection of what we find with Abraham and with Isaac. This is in Genesis chapter 16. You recall Sarah has been barren to that point, and so she gives Hagar her maid to Abraham to wife. And Hagar conceives, and Sarah becomes very angry about that. 
And we find beginning in verse 6, But Abraham said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And while Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. Excuse me for just a second. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness. Interesting. The angel of the Lord, the same who spoke to Abraham from heaven. He said, Avraham, Avraham. It's the angel of the Lord that finds her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hand. That doesn't sound like a very promising venture, does it? Sarah has just been dealing very cruelly with Hagar. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, that is unto Hagar, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. God is giving promises to Hagar, the Egyptian bond slave. The angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. God looks down, and he sees not only those of us who are believers, but he sees the world. He knows everything that's going on. He has purposes in it that we may not understand. Here's one of them. The Lord hath heard thy affliction, and he will be, speaking of Ishmael, he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of his brethren. Verse 13. Here we find it. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. Not merely that he looked down, he saw her, he observed her, and went on his way. God saw her in a way that made provision for her. It's a little phrase that we used to make our children memorize. Thou God seest me. Remember it everywhere you go in the dark places, in the light places, when your thoughts begin to wander where they should not, when you begin to say a word that you realize will not glorify Christ, when you begin to have an attitude, when you perceive in yourself some motives that are not clean, remember that phrase, Thou, God, seest me. Because he looks at us and provides that which is beneficial, including our discipline. We'll see that in other passages of Scripture. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Bir la Haroi. Behold, it is between Kadesh and and Bered. Bir Lahaharoi. What does that mean? Literally, it is the well of him that liveth and seeth me. The well that provides the water, the one who sees me. We have a God like that, friends. He's the God who spoke to Abraham. He's the God who restrained Abraham's hand before the knife fell. He is the one who sees and the one who provides. Let me give you just a few other illustrations of where God's seeing is for the purposes of benefiting his children and for the purposes of punishing the evil, not merely observing what they do. Second Chronicles 16 verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, 
to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. It gives you the picture of God scanning the earth constantly, monitoring the earth constantly, but it's for a purpose, to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. How's your heart? Do you have a heart condition in the spiritual realm? Is your heart perfect toward the Lord? God is looking for it so that he might show himself strong on your behalf. Psalm 34, verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. Does God see you? Does God know when you're going through that very narrow path and when things are squeezing in on you on all sides and you can barely gasp for breath? Do his ears hear when you cry out to him? It tells you who he sees and hears. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 21. The ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. He doesn't just glance down. He ponders the path that we walk on. That's the picture of one who is sitting there to determine what should be done about this one who is walking down this path? The eyes of the Lord. The ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. Proverbs 15.3 The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. You cannot go anywhere that God does not see you. David says in the Psalms, if I ascend up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. You cannot escape not merely the gaze of God, but the pondering gaze of God, the way that you're going. What will he do because of the way in which you are going? So that he might focus you back on the path of life. The eyes of the Lord. In relation to the wicked, behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. What happens to a sinful kingdom? The eyes of the Lord are upon it. And the eyes of the Lord are determining something about it. We find the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous in a beneficial way. We find the eyes of the Lord are upon the sinful for the purpose of precise and exact judgment. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 10. For who hath despised the day of small things? Zechariah, as you recall, was prophesying at the rebuilding of the temple after the return from Babylon. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. Interesting. The hand of Zerubbabel with those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. Do you know that verse is referenced in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6? And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. Interesting, because Peter picks up that theme in the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, 
and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Peter is quoting Psalm 3415, which we read just a moment ago. He's reminding us as believers today that God still is watching his people and the way in which they walk as to whether or not he will bless them or send corrective measures, which are really a blessing also, keeping us from going too far off of the path, the disciplining hand of a loving Heavenly Father. But that lamb that is standing on Mount Zion, very interesting. Mount Zion is the place where Abraham offered Isaac. Did you notice it described the lamb as it had been slain? This is a standing lamb, but a lamb that has been slain. Slain lambs do not stand. This is our resurrected Lord. He is the Lamb. Here we are on Mount Zion, the place from which he will rule. But he is the slain Lamb who is now resurrected from the dead. And we find these eyes are sent forth into all the earth. Seven. Complete perfection, standing lamb, resurrected Christ, horns, omnipotent power, eyes, omniscience. But God does not merely see us. God sees us with the purpose of meeting our need. Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He does not meet all of our greed. He meets all of our need. He knows what we need and he knows what we don't need. What we want most of the time is money. What we want most of the time is great health. What we want most of the time is an easy life. What we want most of the time is popularity with other people. But he knows what is needed to develop in us the character of Christ. He knows what is needed to develop in us faith in him as the provider, the one who sees, the one who meets our needs. My God shall provide all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Jesus spoke of it many times in the Gospels. I'll give you a few references. Matthew 6, 8. Be not ye therefore like unto them, that is the Gentiles around you, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. He knows what you need before you ask. He knows before you even know. You see, he sees in advance and he prepares for the need in advance. Verse 32, Jesus says the same thing, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Do you think God ever misses a beat? Do you think that in him taking care of all the other people around you, he overlooked one of the things that you know absolutely was a need and God didn't do it? Or is it more like God knew what you thought you needed, but he chose not to give it to you because he was developing spiritual character? That's hard for us to take. We are selfish people. We are self-centered people. We are self-interested people. And so when we don't get what we want, we tend to to complain and blame God. Ten times the children of Israel complained against God in the wilderness. And God finally said, okay, ten's the magic number. You're going to die. Tired of listening to the complaining, you're going to die in the wilderness and your children will inherit the land. Oh, how God hates a murmuring and a complaining spirit because God always meets our needs, and if we say he does not, 
we are calling him a liar. We're calling our Lord a liar. Luke 12, 30, again, Jesus says it. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. He knows what you need. And he has promised to supply it. Hebrews 4.13 and Hebrews 4.16 give us a little more insight into this. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Thou God seest me. Every creature is manifest, that is openly exposed in the sight of God. All things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You can't hide inside your house. You can't hide behind fancy clothes. In the sight of God, you're naked. That's the one with whom we have to do. We cannot cover and doll up and fix up in such a way that we can hide what we are really like. But he sees us as his children. And he sees us so that he might benefit us and give us his blessing. And that's why three verses later Paul writes, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God sees us. God knows what we need. We can come to him boldly in the times of need. And he will provide. One final verse for our time is up. How does God usually provide for us? When we have those genuine needs, how does he usually provide for us? 1 John 3.17 But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? One of the points that John makes in 1 John is that one of the marks of a true believer is love for the brethren. But he exhorts us, let us not love only in word, but in deed and in truth. God uses his people who are yielded to him and who understand that their material goods do not belong to them. They are merely stewards of what God has given. And part of that stewardship is being directed by the Spirit of God to meet the needs of brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes, God sees. God provides. God moves in his people who are walking by faith to meet the needs of those who are his. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the privilege of knowing you, the true and living God, the God who sees us, the God whose ears are open unto our cry, the God whose eyes are over the righteous, the God who watches our way and who ponders our way. Father, how we thank you that you gave us such a beautiful illustration with Abraham and Isaac. You are the God who saw Abraham with a love and a benevolent spirit to provide for him in a way which would increase his faith and cause him to love you with all of his heart. Father, we thank you for the faith of Abraham. And those who walk by faith are children of Abraham. We pray that you would make us men and women and boys and girls who are people of faith. Those who trust you implicitly. Those who trust you explicitly. Those who walk with you hand in hand day by day those who look at the trials of life as wonderful opportunities to grow in Christ because you have promised that you will meet all of our genuine needs. 
My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And for this we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.